So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first of the Southwest Marine Ecosystems Conferences. Um, it's lovely to have you all join us. Obviously, this webinar series is slightly different from what has happened historically. Um, but thanks to COVID, things are a little bit different. But I think something that we have found within the MBA is that actually these can prove to be really popular and actually allows a lot of people to attend um, who may not have been able to previously for, for various sort of access issues. So great to have you here. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few things with you. Um, when we came to planning this year, or the committee were planning this year, it seemed appropriate to focus on the topics which are core of our interest. So today is on the benthos. And the committee of us that all of the editors for the Southwest Marine Ecosystems Report are organised the 11 webinars covering their subjects, and this is the first. And the schedule for today is going to be, first of all, kicking off with Keith Hescock on the seashore and seabed, following with Matt Slater, who will be talking on monitoring and managing Pacific oysters in South Devon and Cornwall from Cornwall Wildlife Trust. And finally, from Angle, Angus Jackson, um, who will be tracking trends for benthic species using citizen science from Sea Search and Marine Conservation Society. And the schedule is that we'll have 15 minutes um, talks from those three speakers, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. And as you listen to our speakers today, if you could think today also about what observations you've seen in the marine environment in 2020, and they're starting to pull together that report, which you can um, provide information for through the Southwest Marine Ecosystems website. Um, and details of where you can send up will be on the, the weekly webinar updates as well. Um, and so that you're aware, we also offer webinars at the MBA through for our staff and members. So feel free to look those up. Um, our our um, MBA Twitter account always has details of those. So without further ado, I think it's time to pass over to our first speaker, our very own Keith Hiscock from the Marine Biological Association. Um, so Keith, shall I hand over to you? Would you like to introduce yourself and start your presentation? And uh, my task here is to introduce you to uh, some of the things which were happening on the seashore and the seabed around uh, Dorset, Devon, Cornwall and Somerset uh, during 2020. Uh, as a bit of background, what the um, steering group do during any year is we harvest information which is coming through on social media, which has been published in the scientific press, which we've talked about with our chums, uh, and keep a record month by month of um, what might be considered significant events. Um, and then at the end of the year, the different editors of uh, different, the 11 different sections can take those harvested bits of information, the information that they've collected themselves, and normally, you know, just go to one conference on one date in April and make presentations to 200 people. Well, that's not happening this year, but um, we hope that this platform will, will work for you. Um, so I've been dissecting out uh, information on seashore and seabed marine life. Uh, been a bit sparse in 2020, not surprisingly, haven't got out as much as we would have liked to. Uh, but this report, this presentation now, is also intended to tease you into sending in your significant observations, the things which I haven't mentioned and, and which you can um, submit. You can either email me directly and my email will be, will be at the end of the presentation, or you can use the Southwest Marine Ecosystems uh, website. I've had to be very disciplined to stick to benthos because a lot of the interesting observations in 2020 uh, were things like fish and cetaceans and uh, gelatinous plankton, jellyfish and so on. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, don't look out for information on fish, for instance. Obviously, I was just repeating more or less what was, um, what was on them. Uh, so the seashore and seabed, but especially Things like range extensions, species which have been seen to extend their known range, species new to Britain, episodic events, uh, recovery events where something's dis disappeared for several years and it's come back again, but also disappearances um, and any sort of trends and, and so on. So um, those are the sorts of events that we're looking for every year to try and look at patterns and trends. And this is a picture of the seashore and the seabed off the new stone at Wembury Point, where I was actually looking 
to see whether there were any Alaria esculenta, which is a seaweed, a cold water seaweed, uh, which disappeared many years ago from the mainland coast of South Devon, uh, still out at the Eddystone. Um, and I was here looking um, for that species when I took this photograph. But we're just making a start, just making a start, you fill in the gaps. And whatever I put up, um, thank you very much indeed for those people who've supplied images. Um, here are two images starting with seaweeds. And there are warm water species which actually had a previously, and we're talking about 19th century now, uh, wider distribution or higher abundance. 2020 seemed to be a good year for uh, this very pretty uh, seaweed at the top, uh, Podina pabonica. Um, there seem to be very large decreases in distribution and abundance since Victorian times. Now, I've been down to, for instance, Lyme Regis a lot in the last 10, 12 years. I always look for them, I only found them this year. Uh, other people are going to tell me they find them there every year. But um, so, and at Kimmeridge, uh, where Julie Hatcher keeps an eye on such things, uh, very healthy and extensive, and developing a monitoring program. So we might see whether this increase in abundance persists. Uh, another one, which uh, look at that little uh, cutout at the bottom there, bottom right there, uh, that's from 1795. And I do encourage you to look back at historical literature um, because in 1795, Bifurcaria bifurcata was being seen uh, as far east as Portland. And then its distribution seemed to shrink back westwards. Um, but here, Lynn Baldock has uh, increased the known distribution, the current known distribution, uh, further eastwards. Um, and, and so perhaps it's regaining the territory which it seems to have lost. Crabs, um, an interesting one here because, uh, of course, we're all, we lo all looking for warm water species to turn up in southwest waters. Uh, but here's a stone crab, Nithodes Maya, uh, photographed by David Fennick, but caught in deep water to the west of Isles of Scilly. Why not? Because you're below the thermocline the water temperature is much lower uh, than the surface. So I don't necessarily find that as unusual, but it's certainly notable. Another aspect of distributions is of course, non-native species. Um, and keep your eye open for Asian shore crabs. Um, uh, this is a, an individual found by Steve Truella. It's been recorded in British waters since 2014. It's another one of those non-native species, which is snuck into Britain, done quite well, bred, and perhaps it will extend further westwards. So there's something for you to look out for and, and report. Uh, another species which uh, is more of a sort of western, southwestern species, a warmer water species, uh, which has been recorded further east in uh, 2020. Uh, I know that Steve Truella found a buried female a few years ago but uh, is finding more at Kimmeridge now. So they're becoming uh, more abundant further eastwards. And again, do look out for uh, species like this and do realize that it, it is a significant record uh, if you uh, increase the known distribution. And this is absolutely amazing. Uh, I went to Lundy for four or five days at the end of August and on arriving there, uh, looked over the jetty and you could see that washed up on the strand line were absolutely masses and masses and masses of the shed shells of spider crabs. Now we know all about this from Babacombe, uh, this year it was Charleston, North Cornwall, places in Pembrokeshire, that these spiny spider crabs gather together to molt. So there's strength in numbers, um, and last night I got hold of a picture which I'd taken, taken from the jetty on Lundy, looking straight down um, and painstakingly counted the number of spider crabs that I could actually see, live ones, the ones which are still facing upwards and you can see their shells uh, rather than their dead bodies. And I counted 640. Well, that's going to be a rough count, isn't it? And since they're about two deep 
when you look at the videos, you see that they're crawling over each other. Then perhaps there's as many as a thousand spiny spider crabs have gathered there to molt. Now, although I discovered that there'd been video taken in 2017, in 50 more, 50 plus years of going to Lundy, um, I have never seen or heard of these sort of spider crabs aggregations occurring, these molting aggregations. So do look out for them. Um, you know, do record uh, such events. It's not a species distribution event. Um, you know, they occur reasonably, reasonably far north, but not very far north. Um, but do record these sorts of events. Uh, the picture on the right there is actually a soft one. It's one which has already shed its shell. And I, I can't really see it, but I'm actually squeezing it. It's like squeezing a tennis ball. Um, but it's already started to decorate itself with, with seaweeds uh, to camouflage itself. So uh, to me, a worthwhile, interesting observation, particularly in view of my you know, specific interest in, in, Lund in Lundy. So where else and when in Southwest England? Of course, we found the whole uh, re-emergence of spiny lobsters in parts of Southwest England where they've been made uh, locally extinct absolutely fascinating and um, I've made inquiries to find out what the situation was in uh, 2020 because the amount of data coming in wasn't very much I think Angus will mention that in terms of sea search data as well uh, but are the numbers of spiny lobsters holding up <coughs> is recruitment still occurring what do you think because you divers in particular uh, you go out and some people do rough counts. They'll come back and say, oh, I saw about 20 spiny lobsters. Or at Firestone Bay in Plymouth Sound, oh, I managed to see four spiny lobsters in total. Well, for the past several months, perhaps six months, um, no spiny lobsters have been seen at, Spy at Firestone Bay in Plymouth Sound. And it does seem as if the numbers on the open coast are not as high as they were. But, you know, if you do rough counts and do do rough counts, then let us know what you think is happening with regard to the size of the spiny lobster population. Uh, the Devon and Seven Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority uh, do excellent work with very limited finances and are trying to follow um, the abundance of spiny lobsters uh, and have some marine conservation zones where uh, their uh, take is prohibited. Uh, but they've been looking particularly at the Skerries Bank and there are no buried crawfish the lobsters which were settling from 2014 onwards should by now have eggs according to their size. So let me know uh, if you've seen any with eggs and when you see them out in the open, grab them, turn them over, see if they're females, see if they've got eggs. So that, that's a request. We want to know whether they're actually uh, breeding. And just as a sort of almost an aside, there's a species of um, spiny lobsters, uh, langoustros, uh, Palinurus mauritanicus, which has been known for a long time in deep water in the southwestern approaches, and a very large catch of those was landed at Ulin on the 24th of August. So plenty out there in deep water. More crustaceans. Um, you've probably seen that picture on the left before. Uh, you know, Periclymenes sagittifer uh, looks absolutely tropical. You know, if you go to dive in Indonesia, the Red Sea and so on, you'll see them in the tentacles of, of sea anemones, known for a very long time from the Channel Islands, first seen in Britain in 2007. Um, but um, now there are other uh, um, sightings, including particularly at Kimmeridge Bay. So this warm water species turned up in 2007. Look on the sea anemones, the uh, snake locks and enemies. That's where they are. Look on the snake locks and enemies. Uh, and, and see if you can find any. And then um, there are always <coughs> new records from David Fennick uh, in Penzance, uh, looking through kelp holdfasts or on marina pontoons. Um, this is a slightly iffy um, record of the, this amphipod, uh, Pyla Haley. Um, uh, though he's gone to the experts to get it identified with certainty, there are various bits of the samples he's got which are missing. And so it's still a little bit, is it, isn't it? But if it is, um, then it might well be, um, you know, a range extension at least, or probably a non-native species. 
And then again, this gruesome looking creature bottom left here uh, by Steve Truella. Steve does great things picking through um, strand lines uh, and things which are washed up on strand lines. And those things that are washed up might have come all the way across the Atlantic from the east coast of the United States. So a Scotty Bake Pot um, at Warbarrow Bay, live Idotia Metallica, uh, travelled all the way across the Atlantic. And perhaps that's one of the ways that um, non-native species uh, reach our shores, particularly associated with floating plastic. Uh, cephalopods, uh, a lot of interest and even excitement in 2018 and 2019 uh, because there are a lot more Mediterranean or common octopus turning up. Um, you know, they've become occasional. You, you know, you are likely to see one on a, on a dive in uh, off Cornwall or Devon, South Devon. But um, no, in 2021, sorry, in 2020, um, perhaps less divers in the water, but I've only got two records. Of course, send me more. Uh, but one of them was dead. That was uh, John Hepburn who found this dead one at Wembury Point. Um, the other one uh, was photographed at, at Babacan. Uh, and you might shout, oh, Mediterranean species, it's global warming. Be very, very careful about how you interpret these things that pop up. Um, in the case of the common octopus, uh, a paper by Reese and Lumby drew attention to the fact that in 1900, or 1899 and 1900, there was a plague of common octopus. And it was a plague because they'd go into the lobster pots and take the lobsters. And a lot of fishermen actually had to give up fishing that summer. And then it happened again in 1950. So occasionally you get these uh, incomings of species, which if you don't look back on your, on your records, you might shout global warming. Curled octopus, there seem to be a lot more of those about in the southwest. It's a, it's a cold water species. What's it doing? Becoming more abundant in our warmer waters. Um, there's a story to tell there, but much more frequent occurrence along the south coast of Devon and Cornwall in the past, say, three years. And an interesting one, a high abundance of cuttlefish off Babacan Beach, and that's put down by local divers be most likely because of no or reduced potting for cuttlefish just offshore as a result of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic um, boats tying up I presume. So these are important records and you'll hear more about cuttlefish in the talk on management. Slugs, I, this, the Celtic sea slug is a fascinating little beast. Uh, it's mostly found on surf beaches. Uh, it was known from Croyd in North Devon but when I went to London at the end of August, then Rosie Ellis, the assistant warden there, uh, was delighted to show me that she'd found uh, Oncidella Celtica on Lundy. And with all of the work which has gone on on Lundy in the last 50 years, you'd have expected it to turn up if it had been pre present previously. So a very good find and someone with very sharp eyes. A lot of you out there have got very sharp eyes, much sharper than mine, and you see things like this. More slugs. Uh, this is um, a picture by Matt Slater, uh, but Shannon Moran found this tiny, tiny, tiny little slug. It's a Sacaglossum, not a nudibranch, uh, and it's about three millimeters long, and it feeds on filamentous green algae. Uh, probably, probably a new record for Britain, but further investigation needed. Uh, and this nudibranch, Pruvotifolia. Um, present in Pool Bay uh, and a huge extension eastwards, a uh, report by Mike Markey. Now, do be aware that sea slugs tend to disappear for many years and then pop up again. So a species of sea slug might be present in quite high abundance for many years, and then suddenly you're not seeing it again. But you don't see it for 30 years or something like that. Uh, Grylada elegans is the one to look out for. That used to be present on Lundy and Scoma and such like in the mid 80s, until the mid 80s, we haven't seen it since. Very conspicuous, very easy to identify. It's doing what nudibranchs do, it's disappearing for decades on end. And then of course you get some new species records which are simply 
taxonomists having a field day again. Oh goodness, the number of name name changes which there've been. Every time I put a slide together, I've got to check that the name that I'm using, the scientific name, is the current name. So do be aware that names are changing rapidly. But in the case of this little sea slug here, which looks a bit like Polycera, Polycera quadrilineata, it's found to be now, a, there is a separate species, uh, Polycera norvegica. Um, so that's, that's the sort of thing which happens with taxonomy. Uh, and also uh, too late for me to put a picture in really, but uh, a rare nudibank found in North Cornwall. Non-native species, um, John Bishop and his colleagues at the Marine Biological Association do good work um, surveying non-native species in particularly in various marinas, estuaries and so on. And uh, they, um, they've been really cut back uh, in 2020 uh, because of travel restrictions. And most of their work has been in the uh, area of Plymouth. Uh, but you think things like the uh, estuary or freshwater hydroid Cordlophora on the left hand side there recorded in the Plym estuary, Hydroides isoensis found on the shore at uh, Reston. Um, uh, these are range extensions, these are known range extensions. Look and you might find, um, and then other species becoming uh, more abundant. Uh, but I, I'm not aware of any certain records of new established non-native species during 2020. Uh, you tell me different. The divers will, will recognize this. Um, it's the view up the mooring chain of XHMS Scylla. Now, XHMS Scylla continues to inform our understanding of settlement and succession. And, you know, we, we've done a pretty good job of, in a very sort of casual, informal way, recording colonization uh, and changes in dominant species and so on, uh, which is important for understanding uh, the uh, likelihood of species recovery, uh, the uh, sorts of uh, fouling organisms that occur on steel wrecks and, and so on. Um, we published the paper in the Journal of the Marine Biological Association in 2009, describing the first five years of colonization. And since then, there's really been a, a sort of shift in abundant species rather than lots of additional species being recorded. By the time we got to year five, almost all of the species which now colonize uh, Scylla uh, had, had, had turned up. But you've got things like a strange thing like Matridium sinali, this uh, plumos anemone, is not so abundant as it was in previous locations. I'd be interested to know what you think about abundance of plumos and enemies and sea enemies in general uh, around the southwest. They seem to have declined in the last few years in abundance. Uh, feather stars, Antidon bifida and dead men's fingers, Olcianum digitatum, uh, visually dominant when I was there uh, on two occasions in 2020. And then I had an email saying that somebody had seen uh, lots of tiny mussels on the bow of the Scylla in about August. And so I thought, well, I've got to get out there and see for myself. And sure enough, there'd been another one of those occasional, very dense settlements of uh, mussels on Scylla, uh, which I looked at again in October. Sorry, I should have put this picture up of um, plumos and enemies. Uh, and this picture of, you can't really see it because these mussels are only about eight millimeters long. But as soon as the mussels arrive, and it's happened before on Scylla, there've been occasional settlements of mussels. And it, as soon as the mussels arrive, then the common starfish turn up and eat them. So episodic events. And again, we'd like you to report these sorts of episodic events that occur every few years. Uh, in general, Scylla, um, the reef is holding up well. The roof of the bridge has collapsed. I say collapsed, but it looks to me almost as if somebody's pulled it off, rather like the ring pull on a can of beans, they, they pulled it back. And I just wonder whether somebody's dropped an anchor into the uh, hatchway on the top of the uh, roof of the bridge and uh, pulled on it and actually broken the, the top of the bridge. But uh, let me know if you know more. So there are changes, uh, but in general, 
um, it's proving, continues to prove to be very interesting from the point of view of uh, succession. Strandings, I do strandings. Um, things like jellyfish uh, will be in uh, Angus Atkinson's presentation, uh, but I include things like stalk barnacles. Uh, I think looking through the records, I would say that there have been the usual sort of strandings of stalk barnacles, um, and uh, some of them have got Columbus crabs in them, sea beans washed up in North Cornwall. I have concluded a normal winter, um, uh, and you can tell me differently, or a normal winter, in other words, the beginning of 2020 and the end of 2020. Do you think it's been uh, a particularly strong winter for um, things washing up on the strand line, then let me know because I conclude a normal winter. But now I'm on to the one which I find most exciting at all of all in 2020, and it's called miscellaneous. Um, it doesn't really fit in any of the categories, so I've grabbed it. And it's the fact that more and more otters are being seen in the marine environment around um, South Devon and around Cornwall. So my attention was drawn when I saw this picture top left of an otter consuming an eel in the um, Plymouth Yacht Haven Marina in Plymouth and um, it's taken with a, a, an iPhone. Uh, so it's not very clear. iPhones don't work with telephoto. You need a proper camera. Uh, but the proper cameras are owned by ornithologists. And Barry Rankin got uh, these superb pictures of uh, an otter. Uh, at the beginning of December, um, sorry, uh, in March, uh, in March, uh, at the same marina, Plymouth Yacht Haven Marina in Clovelly Bay on the Mountbatten Peninsula. So we're getting otters in the water, but also coastal habitats in Cornwall. And the Cornwall Mammal Group have just completed an 18th month project uh, the paper that they've written is submitted for publication, so it's not yet published. Uh, and very interestingly, draw attention to the fact that way back in the 17th century and in the early part of the 19th century, otters were considered a marine species. So you've got records that also come from Cornwall Wildlife Trust and Environmental Record Centre for Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. Um, do send them in. Now, very often the records are not of the otters themselves, but of their springs. So I thought I'd put up this uh, picture of otter poo uh, so that you can actually um, see what you're looking for. Uh, you're looking for this sort of black, slimy, three to ten centimetres long, uh, you know, up to four inches long uh, on prominent locations near to water. Um, and, and you should recruit them, report them perhaps to your local mammal group. Uh, and also, of course, look out for the otters themselves. And when I say look out for them, 10 days ago, an otter was seen in uh, the Sutton Harbour Marina in Plymouth. And on Sunday, this, this last Sunday, five days ago, apparently there were 20 people watching two otters uh, moving from moored boat to moored boat at the entrance to Hoo Lake, uh, just off the Plym. So they're about. Finally, <coughs> so what? So what? What does it matter? Why do we do this? Um, it's all to do with, as I say, episodic events, recovery, disappearances. These are the trends worth mentioning. And some of them you need to understand because you might get a phone call from uh, the television people. They're often press worthy. And if you know your stuff, if you look at Southwest Marine Ecosystems reports, you can give an authoritative answer rather than just grabbing that global warming handle and pulling that. Uh, but we, but critically, we need to have a way of preserving the sorts of observations which we're collecting during Southwest Marine Ecosystems. We must be able to make objective interpretation and we must be able to carry those records forward into the distant future. So speaking to Dan Lear, uh, who runs the uh, UK Archive Marine Species and Habitat Data Programme, DASH, based at the Marine Biological Association. Uh, Dan tells me that they are actively developing a mechanism to capture species observations and integrate them into marine biodiversity 
data infrastructure. At the moment, if you want to find out what's known about the general biology of species and the way that they behave and events and so on, uh, you'll probably find it on the Marine Life Information Network, the Marlin web pages, uh, which are not comprehensive in terms of species, but uh, it's a good starting point and they're spin out uh, in, in terms of the uh, biotic uh, catalogue. Uh, and, and the trouble is that if we have these great ideas of having some sort of um, a database or incorporating the information we collect, uh, very often that needs to encourage organisations that fund that work to fund it. So do bear all that in mind, especially if you're one of those organisations. This is very worthwhile information. It's very important for giving a context to the results of monitoring. Um, and you can send your additional observations to me or post them via the um, Southwest Marine Ecosystems website. Uh, so with that, I'll say thank you very much uh, and pass back. That's great. Thank you very much, Keith. That was a great talk. Nice to always end a presentation with a picture of some poo. Um, lots of people very excited about the otter sighting. Um, Douglas Hudson saying that there was uh, one that was swimming around Mount Batten Breakwater on the 7th of January of this year. Um, Bill Lart saying that very much in Scottish waters. And um, within a lot of the questions, we've got quite a few observations here. So just so you know, all of these um, comments will be recorded. Um, so we can pass those on to Keith as well. Um, we've got some questions here that um, in the great way that uh, virtual conferences work, some of you have already answered. Um, so Rebecca Nichols was asking for the best way to go about checking latest species name. Um, for example, something like Plumo's anemone, which Sea Search Online has pointed out has actually changed from Metridium Sinile to Metridium uh, something else, I can't remember what it was on the post, I'll have a look again. Um, so that's the website for that is the World Registry of Marine Species, that's marinespecies.org. Um, and other questions that we've got here, we had one from Anya as well, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. So Anya was just asking about whether her observations from Ireland would also be uh, uh, beneficial. Um, I don't know if Keith, if you've got anything to add for that, but this um, C Search Online has again responded saying that you can um, contribute any C Search forms to your local coordinators. Uh, can, I, can I just say we're always looking for uh, context. Um, so, Erica from Ireland, observations in Scotland, obviously, we're really sort of concentrating on um, the southwest of England, but uh, we, we, we like to put things into context. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just read through some of these sightings. Um, so Mike Paulson saying that the few trips he did to Corbin Head and Livermead last year showed a marked increased abundance of uh, P. pavonica compared to 2019. Um, Blaise Billamore saying that spiny lobster records as well as sex berries location depths try also to record size. Um, so I think, I think that's just a reminder for people to record all of those different parameters if you see the spiny lobsters. Do you have anything to add to that, Keith? Um, yes, and I think Angus Jackson might have a bit more to say on that in the uh, Sea Search presentation a bit later. Okay, great stuff, thank you. Um, and people pointing out that the otter sprint has a lovely sweet and fishy smell to it. Thank you, Nigel and David, for that. Um, Julie Hatcher also commenting um, that uh, she's seen spiny lobsters regularly in the shallow waters in Chesil Cove area. Um, and we also have uh, some comments. It's, it's mostly observations here, so I can't see too many more questions for Keith. We are a little bit over time, so I might move on. Christine Wood pointing out that Hemigraxus sanguineus wasn't seen since 2014 until this year with two confirmed records in Osmonton and Brighton. And that um, Hemigraxus tachinoi, the other Asian crab, is now established around Kent and East Anglia. And I think that's pretty much it in terms of, of questions for you, Keith, but lots of great observations, which you might like to have a look through. Oh, I've got one here, a question actually from Vicky Chung, who's asking, have some of the episodic events, e.g. settlement of mussels and subsequent starfish on the Scylla, been linked with physico-chemical or suspended particular count variations? We don't probably have that sort of uh, information on environmental quality in its broadest sense, as it were. 
but uh, certainly it struck me that there'd been a lot of uh, muscle settlement on uh, open rock surfaces in places like Whitsun Bay, where the Scylla is uh, sunk, but also in other places that I visited in Cornwall, for instance, uh, at Morganport, uh, I was very struck by the very extensive and large settlement of uh, mussels there uh, this summer. So I do just wonder whether the mussels have had a good year uh, all around the Southwest Peninsula, but why, who knows, plenty of food about. Whenever there's plenty of food about, um, you know, species um, get very fit and healthy, and when they're fit and healthy, they reproduce like bilio. Great stuff. Thanks, Keith. And another one from Paula Ferris. Hello, Paula. Um, what's the status and impact of Colocanthus? If I'm pronouncing these correctly. Uh, sorry, Colocanthus. Remind me. Colocanthus. Um, did I put that one up? I'm not sure. Paula, if you wanted to um, say anything about that, you could um, unmute your microphone if Jack allows that. I, I should be able to put a face to the name of Paula Canthus. He's a red uh, seaweed. Paula, remind me. Paula's muted. It's a red seaweed, Keith. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, yes. Um, it's a pom pom weed. Thank you. It's the pom pom weed, that's right. Yes, that's the polite name for it. It's absolutely carpeting the North Devon Rocky Shores. Ah, okay. Well, it used to be much more abundant at places like Wembury than it is now. Uh, I mean, I haven't been to, down to Wembury very much this year because when we've been allowed to go out, it, it, quite honestly, it's so crowded that I tend not to go there. Uh, but certainly it's um, something which has perhaps been and gone a bit at Wembury, but you've got it in North Devon now. Um, so Olympic. I think that uh, <laughs> these things have good years and bad years. Keep an eye on it. But it's here to stay. Yeah. Great stuff. Thanks, Keith. Um, thanks, Paula. Um, and we've got a hand up from Christine as well. Is that Christine? Yes. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah. No, I was going to reply to the call of campus question. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So it's it's very yeah, it's it's invasive around a lot of the southwest. It's all over Mount Batten Beach everywhere. Um, we've seen it in North Devon, yes. Um and uh, it's it's spreading everywhere basically. It's Colocanthus ocamuri, and it's the red pom pom weed. Great, thank you. And I've got Jules Zagay who's also saying that there's lots in North Cornwall as well. It um, seems to have a northern limit. We don't see it beyond the southwest, really. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Christine's one of John Bishop's group and uh, is the authority. I certainly am not. Great, right. thanks, Keith. Um, and uh, I think that's it for the questions. Um, Douglas Addison's just pointing out to Anya that fish records from Ireland would be most, most welcome for fish database. Um, and just to say, for any of you that started this um, session a little bit later than my introduction, yes, it is going to be recorded and the links to the videos will be available afterwards on the Southwest Marine Ecosystems website. Um, and if you do want to ask questions, ask them the Q&A function or you can put your hand up and then our moderator, Jack, will be able to um, turn your microphone on so you can ask the questions. Um, but feel free to ask a question about any of the functions if you're having any issues, and, and I'm sure Jack or somebody else will be able to answer for you. OK, so that's great. Thanks ever so much, Keith. Um, as I said, we'll record all those observations that have been written down as well, and Keith might be able to add to any of the comments in the Q&A section. So the next speaker that we have is Matt Slater from Cornwall Wildlife Trust. I'm sure many of you know him. And he's going to be talking on the monitoring and managing of Pacific oysters in South Devon and Cornwall. So, Matt, if you'd like to um, turn the microphone on, which you have, thank you, and share your screen. Yeah. OK, thanks, Maya. So, hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Matt Slater and uh, I work at Cornwall Wildlife Trust and I'm going to be talking to you all about oysters. So um, in particular, I'm going to be talking about the Pacific oyster, which is a non-native invasive species. And it's one that's becoming more and more common around the southwest, as many in the audience will already know. OK, pressing the button and nothing's happening. <laughs> So, it's 
Sorry, everybody. I'm not sure why quite often slide on the isn't changing. Screen, sometimes on the screen on the bottom left corner, you can hit a, an arrow there as well if it's not working. All right. Um, try that. Good old technology. That's very strange. Sorry, everybody. Actually happened to me the other day as well. Talk. It did start eventually. Shall I stop sharing and start again? Yeah, feel free. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sorry about this. And I'll, right. I'll just. It all worked perfectly in our in our <laughs> yeah. <setting> up system. <laughs> it did. Right. Sorry, everybody. Okay. Hopefully, you can see that. Yeah, that's all visible. Yeah, there we go. Great. Yeah. I'll start again. Okay, so <laughs> thank you, Maya. So I'm going to be talking to you about oysters and in particular the non-native Pacific oyster, which is becoming increasingly abundant in, in the southwest. So I'm very fortunate. I grew up in Cornwall um, and um, spent most of my childhood knocking around Falmouth Harbour. And, uh, you know, we never used to see Pacific oysters. Certainly we never saw oysters attached to the to the harbour walls, which is now becoming a really common sight all around the southwest. And I studied marine biology and when I came back, couldn't find a job. So I was a fisherman for a bit and uh, obviously I got to know the native oyster quite closely. Ended up working on um, the foul oyster fishery, which is a, a unique fishery. It's the last remaining commercial fishery um, for native oysters in Europe and um, the reason it sort of persisted as you know is because it was limited to sail and ore over a hundred years ago so it's uh, quite an inefficient fishery. Anyway in those days we would never see Pacific oysters and and on the shoreline around around the foul you never see them but that's all changed and uh, huge numbers are now showing up on the intertidal predominantly so they're you know, to tell the tell the two species apart are quite different the native oyster is normally subtidal very rare on the intertidal and, and only on very very low spring tides when you find it at the very bottom of the shore but mainly subtidal on on banks that are covered all um, at all stages of tide and uh, they're flat they have a, a straight aperture so when the shell opens up there's a, it's a straight line the gap the Pacific oyster is very different with this wavy aperture and a much more irregular shape. And the other thing that you find with a Pacific oyster is if it settles onto rock, it will uh, one of the valves will completely fuse to the rock, uh, making it very hard to remove without damaging it. And uh, the Pacific oyster is really uh, feral. Pacific oysters are really um, really huge now and going going wild all around the, the southwest so here's uh, some nice mature pacific oysters on the shore and yeah as i said they're a non-native species they they were first brought to the uk of, uh, in the 1920s and into cornwall in about the 1960s and, and they've been farmed they um They've caused problems in many other areas of the world. In fact, they're now pretty much circumglobal. And in other areas of Europe, they've caused large problems. So in the German and Dutch Wadden Sea, um, they arrived in, in the sort of 1970s and 80s. And now they've pretty much completely overrun those areas. And um, according to sort of local experts, they've now started to spread into the subtidal. So although they prefer the intertidal, uh, there is this danger that if the populations are large enough in the intertidal, the reefs that form will then start to spread down into the subtidal where they could compete with our native oysters, which, as, as you all know, are very rare. They're highly reproductive, so each oyster can produce up to 200 million larvae. As Keith was saying earlier, if it's a good year, they reproduce like bilio. And we certainly had successful spatfuls in the last few years. So concerned about uh, the impact, particularly on our um, European marine sites, such as the Fallon Halford SAC and the Tamar SAC, um, Natural England managed to get some European funding for a two year study uh, with uh, Natural England as the lead partner, Cornwall Wildlife Trust and South Devon AOND um, delivering the, the field work with volunteers. So the aims of the project were to mobilise citizen scientists volunteers to go out and survey and record the oysters 
um, to trial manual control methods where appropriate. Certainly um, manual culling of oysters appears to be one of the only practical methods of controlling them and it's been carried out in many other areas of, uh, of Europe and um, uh, in Kent along the, on, on the east coast it's been carried out very successfully. But we also wanted to investigate alternative uses for these Pacific oysters. Now, fortunately in Cornwall, uh, we have the amazing Yorkshire network of, of marine conservation volunteer groups all around the Cornish coast. Now, we, the Wildlife Trust has been supporting and helping develop this network of, of groups. There, um, at each of these sites, we've got amazing people who do such great work. Uh, and so really, we had a, a ready audience of um, potential volunteers. And uh, we mobilised that, that, those teams and we ended up training uh, in Cornwall. We trained 14 teams and provided them with all the equipment they needed so they could go out and they could carry out surveys. And what we found was that actually the extent of the problem was far greater than we realised at the beginning. And, you know, huge areas of our, of our Cornish coastline are now uh, pickled with oysters. So this is the east shore of the, the Fal Estuary. Um, from Turnaware up to St Moors, it's just covered in, in oysters along the rocky shore there. But we're finding in areas, in estuaries, particularly where the conditions are really optimal, we're finding that oyster reefs are already forming. And this is a very extensive oyster reef in the Foy estuary. And similar reefs have been found in the Tamar near Tor Point. They've been found in the Fal um, estuary. And, uh, you yeah, know, Clearly, in this, in this case, what was previously a soft, sort of sandy um, area with a few pebbles and shells is now a very different ecosystem. In the, the Yelm estuary in South Devon, um, they've got the same, they've got lots of reefs. And this, is, this just shows you the potential for the impact on um, harbours. So harbour masters are getting very concerned. This is a slipway which is virtually unusable now, covered in sharp oysters. And the harbour master at the Yam Estuary uh, apparently is constantly taking people to casualty with cut feet. And you certainly wouldn't be able to get a, a dinghy launching trolley down there. So yeah, they um, when they're growing on these sort of soft habitats, they'll find a small pebble or something like that to settle on. And then once an oyster grows, that oyster then becomes a great settlement surface for more oysters and they end up growing on each other. And you can reach a point where there are, you know, well over 30 oysters per square metre. In fact, we're finding, you know, up to sort of 60 oysters in one 50 centimetre quadrat at some of these reefs. So, um, a report has been put together which hasn't been published yet. So this um, this is one slide from the report. It's being peer reviewed at present, so I'm not able to share share any of the results of the report. But this just shows you the sort of distribution. What was quite interesting as well, we weren't surprised that we found Pacific oysters in estuaries because the conditions there are great for their growth. But very surprising, they're starting to show up in places like Whitsand Bay, which is a surfing beach, very exposed, Mounts Bay. And even on the North Cornish coast at St Ives Bay, there's a significant population of Pacific oysters. And they grow large. So this is a, a really large one. It's probably nearly half a kilo. And, um, you know, certainly highly reproductive, as we heard earlier. What was quite interesting is during the process of the project we were, where we were culling oysters, we'd then return to the same site the following year and find sometimes just as many oysters, except they would be new settled oysters. So this is a, an oyster that settled from the year before. This is um, in springtime, we came across this one. And it's, as you can see, it's in relation to that limpet that's probably you know, one and a half inches across and probably five millimeters deep. So quite a, a wafer thin oyster, but their growth rate is fast. So what impacts do they have? There's certainly potential for them to significantly alter our ecosystems, particularly those intertidal soft banks made up of sand, gravel, mud, etc. And uh, a concern of mine is that perhaps this prevents um, wading, you know, seabirds accessing in fauna, worms, crustaceans, etc. Uh, and you know, equally fish when the tide's high and would prevent you know bass, etc. and bream from getting to their prey. Uh, you know, you're taking one habitat and changing it for another. Now arguably the 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 reef itself is quite high in biodiversity, but but you've you've lost one ecosystem and gained another. So that is a concern. There's also um 
an impact to rocky shores, but perhaps it's less immediate because obviously, you know, you've got a hard substrate there, and you know, you you're not not so radically altering it. But you know, it's possible it might actually change the the makeup of shores as they inundate them, and it can affect harbours. As we already said, there's a risk to humans, and in some of our estuaries, it could become a hazard eventually, resulting in increased siltation. Uh, it could become a hazard to shipping potentially. So our volunteers went out and they carried out lots of surveys and what we found was that the bashing does appear to be effective. You know, in some areas where there's quite a low population, you can definitely keep on top of it, but you're never going to eradicate Pacific oysters is something we certainly realised very soon. The other things we didn't, uh, we didn't find bashing worked if you're, if you're trying to tackle oyster growing on soft seabeds because they move. So, you know, you can't make a hole in the shell. Hand picking the oysters in that environment is probably one of the only options and it can be viable depending on the size of the population, but using diggers, etc., and mechanical methods are likely to be pretty damaging to the wider environment. One of the, the best tools that I came across was made by this chap, Keith. He created a uh, special oyster culling tool and he was incredibly efficient with that metal bar. Uh, in some areas, we found oysters, though, that were, you know, perfectly marketable and looked very similar to farmed oysters. So obviously, you know, um, we didn't like having, you know, killing these animals and having to waste them. And it would be our feeling increasingly was that we should be trying to find some use for them. Uh, and, you know, if a commercial use could be found for them, it may really aid in keeping the populations under control. So what can be done with them? Well, if they're used as food, they first need to be purified. So depurated in filtration facilities, but they can only be collected um, legally and sold from uh, classified shellfish waters of which there are only a limited number of areas in our in the Southwest. So not all of them can currently legally be collected, e even if they're depurated. Uh, they can be processed, heat uh, heat and pressure treated is different. There's different ways of processing them. None of them are kind of really all that viable at this time. Although, you know, we would hope that um, some people might start looking into that in more detail. Through the Cornwall Good Seafood Guide, which is another project that I work on, and um, we've been heavily promoting consumption of all oysters, but um, trying to encourage people to also give these feral Pacific oysters a try. And certainly we've um, we found that um, there seems to be a building enthusiasm for them. And some great recipes can be made using them. And several businesses now in the Southwest are purifying feral oysters and um, finding that the markets were growing very well prior to COVID and hopefully those markets will pick back up. But, you know, only a limited number of the oysters, as I said, are in classified areas, only a limited number of the right sort of shape and size. You can't chip the ones off the rocks because they can't, you know, that damages the shell. So they then will die in purification facilities. So that market is limited. So what other uses can be put to them? Well, uh, a, a great, a great, um, product that could be made out of oysters would be um, soil conditioner and certainly uh, calcified seaweed i.e. mole was extracted from the fowl up until fairly recently and sold and the, it was a very popular product and the, you know Pacific oysters if ground up make a similar product. There are some barriers so you can't let them just compost on on farmland or you know on land because of the animal byproduct order and smells etc so currently they need to be heat treated which adds a lot to cost um, and also they're not worth anything until you found a market for them we actually uh, did a little um, trial run and collected up using volunteers some non-marketable you know wonky really wonky shaped oysters that the merchants weren't interested in from a site in the fowl they were taken away this is some very happy volunteers, socially distanced volunteers, I have to point out, who uh, collected up uh, a ton of oysters, which were then processed by a, a local um, a local entrepreneur who's looking into this idea of creating soil conditioner. And uh, he's very happy with the results. So watch this space. There may be oyster based soil conditions on the market soon. And there's other uses. So one that I've sort of been thinking about increasingly is could they be killed and then used as a culture for native oyster restoration projects. I'd love to speak to some experts on this because obviously the fear of <laughs> that might actually encourage Pacific oysters in the subtitle is something I'm worried about. 
so before we rush down that route but um but maybe worth looking into and then you know it can be it's a great source of calcium carbonate it can be used in chicken and poultry feeds in other countries they use it a lot in aggregate it can be used to make eco-friendly cement it can be heat treated and it turns into a fantastic phosphate remover for aquaculture and other industries so the protein itself is valuable it can be dried it and utilized uh, and surprisingly one of the things that turned up in the in a great literature review that was done by students at the University of Exeter for us was that it's actually being used already as uh, an eco-friendly alternative to limestone uh, in the production of neoprene and here's a wetsuit that's uh, on the market made in France using their oyster shells so there's plenty of uh, opportunity out there and so the outputs of our project, well, um, the report is going to be published soon, showing detailed oyster density maps all around the southwest. We are making, or in Natural England, are making recommendations on what should be done. A market for oysters, feral oysters, seems to be improving, which is good. And uh, we've proven that it can be used to make soil conditioner. Um, our volunteers did an amazing job. As I said earlier, we trained 16 groups in the southwest. So this is Devon and Cornwall and uh, 166 surveys and over 150,000 oysters culled. Uh, and just to finish up on, and I'm sure many people in the audience have sort of already been thinking about this. These oyster reefs are taking and locking up a lot of carbon and they're filtering the water and providing ecosystem services. So clearly we need to weigh up pros and cons of these oyster reefs. There's going to be some areas where they're having a negative impact and other areas where they could possibly have a positive impact. And uh, I think you know more work needs to be going, gone into that. But certainly we've highlighted the, the massive, massive scale of this, uh, this big change in our ecosystems. So thank you to those students at the university for a brilliant, a brilliant literature review. And a massive thank you to all our wonderful volunteers. Thank you very much. That's great. Thanks so much, Matt. We've uh, got a, a few questions here for you, um, some of which you answered in your final slide, actually. So we had one from, um, uh, sorry, they're getting moved around, so <laughs> I'm losing them, from Julie Hatcher that was saying about Pacific oysters, and that although they're being non-native, that they're a benefit from, a, from clear, cleaner, clearer waters because they're efficient filters. And following on from that, Nigel also mentioned the fact that they help trap carbon too. Um, which you've, you've yes, so both of both you predicted what my last slide would be. And yeah, it is something that we need to, to weigh up, but it's it's not actually that straightforward. And when you've got a protected feature of a special area of conservation, you know, being lost, uh, clearly, you know, we need to take it seriously. Right, thank you. Um, and a question from Paul Summerfield. Can a case not be made to extend classified shellfish waters to include oyster sites? <laughs> And he's asking yes. who decides where they're classified and how. Yeah, so um, CFAS, uh, uh, the, the, the you know, agent, government agency that looks at this, and the port health authorities. So I think there is a formal process that you can go through. If, if there's a, a business that wants to start utilising um, an oyster bed that isn't in a classified area, they have to apply. And it can be quite a lengthy process. Um, I'm not, I know it would, it would cost quite a lot as well. There'd need to be a regime of testing brought in and how practical it is for them. I'm, I'm not sure I'm not the right person you need to speak to CFAS, but you know, it's not, not outside the realms of possibility that we could extend those areas, yes. Thank you. Um, and we've got a, a good suggestion from Francis Benny here. So could small community depuration plants allow shore gathering to grow as a hobby? That's a nice idea. And so, certainly, yeah, it is one that we thought about. And I think um, potentially, yes. However, it, it is quite technically um, tricky and it has to be done properly because there is a, a definite public health risk of eating oysters that haven't been properly purified. So obviously the facility needs to be well maintained and it needs to be well managed, but that's not to say it wouldn't work. And uh, yeah, quite an interesting, an interesting idea. Yeah, I'd definitely be keen to talk to people who are, who are, who are interested in that. Great, thank you. And a question from Sarah Birchinoff, who says, do you think that the reefs are more densely populated? Sorry, do you think that the reefs are more densely populated areas you're seeing are self-sustaining and therefore separate from one another? And how much larval movement along the coast is likely to be occurring? Oh, that's a great question. 
I'm, I'm afraid I haven't done a lot of uh, reading on the larvae uh, distribution topic. Well, I, I think, I'm, I might be wrong, um, but I think they, their larvae does travel quite long distances. So, and what's interesting is this mass sort of population explosion has all happened at once across a very large area. So it's, it's quite it's quite possible that the larvae, well, we don't actually know where the larvae came from. It's possible, it, you know, in France, they've had a huge increase in populations of feral oysters. So some of the larvae could have come all the way across the channel. Um, and I think these, it, it's, I think because they've all showed up at the same time, it's pro more, more likely that it, um, yeah, that it is sort of a, a mass broadcast spawning that's been successful across a wider area. Uh, and that would indicate they're all kind of linked to each other. They're all probably quite genetically similar. But that'd be fascinating for, for some studies to be done on that. See if that's right or not. Great, thank you. And a, a question from Toby, which I'm sure is something that other people might be considering, whether there should be sort of guerrilla groups of people that go out and remove the oysters. So he's saying there's quite a number of them on the seawall at Dawlish. And should you be going down there and smashing them up before they expand? What's what's your thoughts on people people sort of doing their own thing? Yeah, we we've well. been a bit careful about it, and obviously the Wildlife Trust have been quite quiet with their messaging. We we haven't really encouraged the public just to go out and kill oysters. It's it's not killing animals isn't really what we do generally. But the um, the other the other thing that's very worth bearing in mind as well is that. A lot of these uh, areas where the oysters are found, um, the seabed is owned by somebody. So you actually really should get permission of the land of the seabed or the harbour owner before you go out and carry out things like this. So getting permissions is quite tricky. So we're a, a bit of a way off encouraging everyone, you know, on Spring Watch or <laughs> national TV, <laughs> whatever, to go out and kill oysters. Um, we're, we're um, but it's not to say it won't happen someday. But we're we're still sort of you know, still working out the the best course of action. Great, thank you. And, and a question from Paula again. Um, so she's asking about the explosion of numbers. Is, it, is that down to the warmer waters that have enabled their reproduction? And weren't they previously thought not to be able to because it was too cold? I mean, that was something that I yeah. certainly heard in my lectures back in the yeah. 90s that they weren't going to reproduce in our waters. That's right. Scientific advice was that it, they'd be far, fine to as an aquaculture species because it's too cold for them to reproduce. But we've actually seen, you know, globally that Perhaps that was a that was a bit optimistic. We've seen globally the Pacific oyster population spreading in some pretty cold areas. You know they're now in Scandinavia. They go up as far as Norway. So the sea temperature maybe is less of an issue. Perhaps they've become acclimatised. Um, having said that, in our estuaries we do find that sea temperatures are they have always been pretty high, haven't they? And, you know, it's very easy to find quite a large area of estuary of sea temperatures well over 20 degrees in the summer months and that's that's apparently optimal. Great stuff, thank you. And just one final question from Toby. So why are Pacific oyster farms still sanctioned in the southwest? Uh, that's, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not really qualified to answer that. It's, it's the decision made by, by, um, by the government. And um, yeah, I, I, and I don't think... Um, Actually, um, culturing oysters, I think, is a, a pretty environmentally friendly way of getting protein from the sea. And I'm certainly not opposed to, to aquaculture or mariculture of shellfish. Um, you know, and I don't blame the industry. Uh, it was working on current advice when they set up all these farms. But whether we should be exp expanding mariculture, certainly we need to be very careful about what areas we're doing in it. And um, hopefully our project is going to help um, a bit more research to be carried out and some more you know some more thought put about future decisions yeah i've noticed keith has got his hand up on my screen oh, okay, <laughs> my, my, if I, I come in can you hear me okay yes keith yep. um there, there's a lot of history to um licensing for pacific oysters um including some very poor science um in the 1970s uh but i'll give you a phone call and i'll, I'll mention those to you uh, but certainly uh, there's a warning about sometimes the distorted advice you get from government advisors. Um, you know, you do need to have good scientific advice. But I thought also, Maya, if I may, I might mention that, um, I might mention that, you know, there are people that we know well, can you see that? <laughs> Who can uh, yeah. vouch for the edibility of feral oysters in this case from the Yam estuary um, and perhaps can even give you some 
hints to how to cook them. So um, <laughs> up to you. Okay. But, uh, there are people out there who have been known to collect uh, feral oysters. I hope his his tummy was okay after that, and he's still still healthy. Oh, no, it was, and there are other people I know who've um, uh, taken them from that location uh, in the yam and uh, have been fine. But that is not necessarily a recommendation. It's up to you. Yeah, we do have to be very careful, don't we, about encouraging that because there are, there are risks involved. Yeah. Sorry, my phone is ringing. <laughs> Hopefully you can still hear me. Um, thanks so much, Matt. Yeah, and, and there are just a couple of comments saying we, we should very much not be encouraging people to go down and smash up marine life. Um, no, no. So I think we should, we should make that point clear. Um, sorry about the phone. Hopefully that'll stop in a second. Thanks ever so, so much, Matt, for your presentation. Be really interesting to see how, how things develop and any solutions that come from it. Um, thanks Great, very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to be moving on next to Angus Jackson. Angus Jackson's from Marine Conservation Society and also Sea Search. Um, hopefully you can hear me. It will stop ringing in a minute. Um, so just uh, worth pointing out at this stage as well that Sea Search is a fantastic organisation that already does a lot of recording for um, from divers and snorkelers, and that all that information, that data goes straight to um, organisations such as Dash to store that information. So, so do do check out Sea Search if you don't know them already. Um, so, without further ado, I'll pass over to Angus, who's going to be presenting on tracking trends for benthic species using citizen science. Thanks, Angus. Thanks very much, Maya, and uh, a big thank you to uh, Keith and Bob for the invitation to come and speak as part of this webinar um, webinar series. Uh, so let me just fire up my screen to share. Okay. Right. So yes, um, uh, as as Maya mentioned, I work for Sea Search as the the data officer um, as, as part of the Marine Conservation Society. And uh, some of the work I've been doing recently is trying to make better use of the, the many, many records that exist in that uh, um, citizen science database uh, collected by, by CSEARCH. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we can use some of those data to track trends in uh, populations of, of benthic species. So if we want to understand how populations are changing, either into response to changing climate or a, a whole range of other anthropogenic threats, uh, if we want to pull out the, the effect of anthropogenic activities from natural variation in populations, we need to have uh, long-term sustained series of, of observations and records, not just in one small place for one particular species, but across multiple trophic levels and across broad geographic scales. And uh, citizen science contributes to this in a, in a big way. Um, for those of you that uh, aren't familiar with Sea Search, it's a citizen science program for volunteer divers that's led by the Marine Conservation Society. Um, and we train divers to how to record species. Uh, we collect the data about these benthic species and the habitats in which they live. And we make that data available uh, on a free basis. Um, you can see from some of the statistics there that it really is a long term, large scale, sustained uh, data series. Uh, covering pretty much the whole coastline of Ireland and the British Isles. Uh, we're pushing up towards 800,000 records now, um, and we've been collecting this data for, for well over 30 years. So it's a pretty impressive resource to, to be working with. Uh, and some of the focus of this talk will be about the spiny lobster that uh, Keith was, was talking about a little earlier. Um, and that's used to historically provide a very valuable inshore fishery, which collapsed uh, almost completely in the 70s and 80s um, through change in from non selective to much more efficient ways of catching them. Um, such that at the start of the century, all the fisheries in the southwest were classed as being uh, in unfavorable condition. And as a consequence, they've been kind of uh, nominated as, as designated features for protection um, for recovery within several marine protected areas. But unfortunately, there's no real formal scientific stock assessment for, for the species. And as a consequence, their kind of current status is, is pretty uncertain. Uh, since 2014, there have been a lot of kind of anecdotal reports, uh, and some of those quite comprehensive. Um, Keith uh, wrote a really 
very interesting article a couple of years ago in British Wildlife magazine, um, sort of describing the old fishery and kind of assessing what might be happening happening with it at the moment. So there's certainly an indication that it has been re-establishing here down in the southwest, but it'd be good to uh, establish really quite how true that is, where that uh, establishment's happening, and and to what extent. So I've been trying to use sea search records to um, provide some robust evidence about this, to look at kind of regional variation um, in the southwest, and to to see if there are uh, similar patterns happening with with comparable species. So how, how do we go about doing this? We've got lots of records, but what do we actually do with them? The, the, the simplest approach uh, can be just to, to plot records as points and, and, and look at this as a, a flat static map. And, and that obviously works, it's quite informative. We can see from the map there that there are certain places where there are more dots than others. And we could compare those from, from year to year. But that's very static and, and not too informative. Uh, you can use, much more clever animated ways using techniques called kernel density estimates to produce animated heat maps and we can see here kind of th change through time as where the records are, are being found so we can see through much of the first decade of the century there's a few isolated records from Lundy and Scilly um, not much at all mostly the screen is white and then as we start to get to the mid-teens we suddenly see brighter red areas appearing uh, particularly around uh, the South Devon coast and as we push through to sort of 17, 18, 19 those records are much more intense, many more being observed and spreading right the way down towards towards Portland um, at the east of its current distribution. So those are much more animated and informative dynamic ways of looking at those records. But there are some some fundamental issues with these sorts of detection surveys. Um, non-detection, if you don't see them, is an, an ambiguous thing. It's not clear whether you don't see them because in reality the species is not present where you, where you go to visit, or it could be that you just didn't happen to see it whilst you were there, but it is actually present at the, at the site. And so to understand reliably the probability of a species being present in a particular place, we need to estimate the probability of detection separately from the, the rate of occupancy. And if we just look at those plots of points or those kernel density estimates, uh, that does not do that. Um, and these unstructured ad hoc citizen science records are also biased, not through any intentional fault, it's just a, a consequence of the way the data are collected. So there's spatial variability in intensity of sampling, there's temporal variability in, in sampling effort, um, even within a visit, a, a longer dive, you're more likely to find more records than on a shorter dive. Um, and of course, detectability is, a, is an important thing. If you go for a dive in the Tamar estuary, you're far less likely to see numerous species as a consequence of the visibility than if you go off to the lovely clear water off uh, Han Deeps. So, and there's some consequences of this bias. So if, if we have changes in the number of observers or the numbers of surveys, the length of surveys, uh, long-term changes in observer experience, um, the, de de excuse me, the detectability will change through time. Uh, and as a consequence, true trends can be hidden or false trends may appear simply because of the, the change in uh, observation effort. And so it's important to try and eliminate these biases when understanding what the true trends in populations actually are. So what solutions might there be to this? So historically, we've always looked at things like atlases. You may be familiar with the kind of the bird atlases and the butterfly atlases that have been published. And these tend to be aggregations of all records over periods of about 10 years. And then a new atlas comes out in the next decade. And you can make kind of visual comparisons between those. They're fairly clunky, but um, up to fairly recently, that was the, the main tools that we had available. Uh, but more recently, um, scientists at the Center for Ecology and Hydrology have been developing more statistical methods. Um, and these are available in, a, in a, a package called Sparta that's implemented in the, the R software environment, but it's freely available on, on GitHub if those of you um, who are interested in this sort of thing want to have a play around with it. Um, and these have alternative approaches to try and uh, eliminate the effects of bias on understanding trends. 
first of which might be called uh, data selection, and that's choosing records only from uh, sites that have been well sampled um, and uh, disregarding places that have few visits or only have very few species recorded. Um, there are other statistical methods for trying to correct for sample effort, um, such as the Telfer occupancy index, um, and there's also these statistical Bayesian models uh, used to estimate occupancy in more complex ways. Uh, which is the best? Well, the kind of data selection methods uh, have been shown after kind of really long term large scale simulation methods. Um, they are robust, they can detect trends reliably, um, but they lose power because you're, you're having to throw away a good proportion of your data that's not in these so called well sampled sites. Um, so they're, they're, they don't detect weak trends very well. Uh, the simple correction methods such as Telfer often fail uh, to represent uh, reality well, um, and by far and away this occupancy modeling approach is the, is the best way to uh, use these uh, citizen science records. What's the process? Um, well, it, it requires building up uh, what's called a detection history, which is a, a record of uh, repeated visits to sites and a recording of presence or absence of, of your species. And this approach has been used really extensively now in the State of Nature report uh, that's produced every three years. I think the last one was, came out at the end of 2019. And these population trends are produced for now for over 8,000 species. And they include many, many terrestrial species, freshwater um, plants, all sorts. Um, in the marine environment, there are cetaceans, uh, fisheries of commercial interest and um, uh, also a few plankton, but there are no benthic species. Out of all those 8,000 population trends that are plotted, no benthic species are included in there. And I think that's a massive hole that we, we need to be working to, to rectify. Um, so I, I've been uh, going about building these occupancy models for sea search data, um, building these detection histories using, using the records in the database, um, and treating sites uh, using a one by one kilometer set of grid cells and treating data from the last 20 years. Um, the, I've been running the model for 100,000 iterations, which takes quite a bit of processing power and, and time. Um, and, and so far, I'm going to show you a few of the, the outcomes from that to do with uh, crawfish, uh, brown crab and lobster. So here we go. This is hot off the, uh, the, the computer just in the last couple of days, um, where we can see a population trend from the sea search records of crawfish from, from Cornwall, from Cornish waters, uh, including 304 sites. And you can generate various metrics that kind of quantify how that population has changed. And the, the, the black line shows the kind of the, the average uh, estimates of occupancy from those 100,000 iterations of the model and the, the gray ribbon shows some kind of measure of confidence in, in how um, reliable those estimates are. And the, obviously the narrower the ribbon, the more confidence you have in it and the broader the ribbon, there's a bit more, bit more noise around that estimate. If we look at a similar uh, set of estimates for uh, South Devon, we can see a fairly similar pattern, not quite as extreme, not quite as uh, a rapid increase in occupancy, but the, the timing of the increase is, um, is, is pretty much spot on with Cornwall. So it's not a case of it arriving in Cornwall and then spreading the next year down to Devon. This is stuff that arrived um, pretty much all at the same time across that uh, stretch of coastline. If we compare that to trends for brown crab, we see really quite different patterns. Um, we can see that uh, brown crab is present pretty much everywhere. Every square kilometer that gets visited by sea search divers, it's, it's present there. And there hasn't been um, any uh, notable uh, increase in, in uh, extent. Um, some slightly concerning um, trends, potentially apparent in Dorset, where there seems to be a, a dip in uh, occupancy over the last five years or so, uh, that's certainly something that uh, we'll be looking into uh, looking into more. And how about we look at the same sorts of things for lobster? Again, different patterns again um, between different different regions of uh, of the southwest. And what this really starts to say quite convincingly is this is not patterns uh, that are occurring because of 
uh, change in observer effort. Otherwise, we might expect to see similar patterns uh, across the uh, across different species. So what, what does this uh, tell us about the future? Um, we, we know very well that crawfish management is likely to be challenging because they're tasty, there's a massive demand, they, uh, they, they call on uh, um, high uh, prices, they, they're very valuable. Um, and, but we can see uh, for inshore waters at least, um, in Cornwall and Devon, there's quite a, a, a definite and robust evidence for the recovery of the population. Um, and this seems to also now be extending down towards Dorset and even, even Hampshire. Uh, this raises the question about whether these um, recoveries are stable, are they going to be long term? Um, Keith, Keith was hinting at perhaps that's uh, not the case. Um, the, one of the joys about these um, modelling approaches is that with each new year of, of sets of records from, from C-Search, we can add those new set of data onto the, the model, run the model again, and we get an extra point at the end of the trend and we can see what happens in, in each subsequent year. Um, and that'll certainly be on my uh, on my calendar when the, the new data set uh, from C-Search comes out in, in a couple of months time. And it'd be very interesting to make some comparisons between uh, what the divers are finding and what's happening with uh, um, landings and landings per unit effort collated by the MMO and, and the various IFCAs. So what are the uses for these occupancy models? There's a risk that we might return to this unsustainable fishery if the, if the population uh, maintains. Uh, and I think that next to large scale stock assessments um, and assessments of landings, then these sorts of models are probably the best sorts of tools that we can uh, use to help support decisions about what management can be can be applied. And um, we can also be used to uh, um, encourage inclusion of, of these sorts of taxa as named features and designated areas, particularly where they might be occurring in places that where they're not uh, have not been found before or at the least uh, not remembered from before. Uh, so I think there's lots of potential for applying these to, to, to real world uh, application. So uh, as a, as a, something that makes me very happy indeed is that it, we can see clearly that uh, C-Search data is, is a large enough set with good enough quality to be able to apply to these sorts of tools and generate population trends that are robust and believable. Um, we can see that crawfish, I think pretty much undeniably now, kind of said to have uh, um, had a big increase in their extent um, in southwest England, but that uh, those population trends vary from, from place to place. And the same sorts of patterns are not being seen in, um, in other similar sized crustacea that live in similar sorts of habitats. It's important to remember, though, that these records um, are only for diveable depths. It tells us nothing about places that divers don't visit or at depths of water that divers don't have access to. Um, but I think that these sorts of occupancy models really should be used to um, help support management in the, in the future. Uh, very important to acknowledge the funding that uh, allows this work to, um, to take place. And of course, um, most importantly of all, the, the fab volunteers that give up their time to collect these records, who record them so assiduously and submit them to uh, the, the various coordinators who um, organize them and deal with the data processing and, and pass them on to me to, to play with. Um, so big thank you, big shout out to all you guys, please keep it up. And uh, if you're interested and haven't been involved before, then please do get in touch to find out about the latest training courses and things like that. Uh, right, so um, that's that's me all done. Uh, more than happy to answer questions if uh, if anyone has them. Thanks so much, Angus. Lovely to hear all of the, the great work that's been done towards the, the crayfish data there. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. We've got one from Chris Wood who's saying, great data. Is the slightly upward trend in Cornwall lobster anything to do with the hatchery? Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant question. We've actually got a uh, an undergrad student doing his uh, honours project this year, trying to establish whether um, hatcheries have um, an effect on um, local records, kind of in the vicinity of where releases get made. Um, so it, it could be, um, 
uh, as a consequence of, of of small individuals being released in large numbers and boosting local populations. But it's it's quite hard to be absolutely certain that there's not other explanations as well. Great stuff, thank you. And, and a question from Guy Hooper as well about the effects of COVID on sea search and the data gaps. Um, which C Search Online has answered. I don't know if C Search Online would like to unmute microphone and, and add to that at all. Um, but the, the comment from C Search Online was that it's running at about 55 to 60 percent of a normal year of data submission in terms of the numbers of forms that are sent in. So there definitely are some gaps uh, where people couldn't get out recording, but need to highlight that Norfolk have had their best year ever. So that's good. C Search Online, are you unmuted now? Do you want to add to that? I am. It's actually Charlotte. Hello. <laughs> it's Charlotte. It's Charlotte Bolton here. I'm the, the national coordinator. Because we have a Zoom host license for doing sea search training, I just come up as sea search online, sorry. Um, so yeah, in terms of in terms of COVID, we, we had it was a funny old year, wasn't it? And not in a not in an amusing way. We we have amazing volunteers that it was very much the onus was on them to go out and do independent surveys. Um, we would advise them about where to go and, you know, where we might have gaps, etc. But it was basically down to the volunteers getting out there and doing things in some places um, for, in Wales, for instance, the, the lockdown, the restrictions were seemed to be much stricter and were, were well policed. So Wales did see a big drop in the amount of data that came in but in other places it was almost like normal the lockdown happened at a time when they wouldn't have been diving anyway because it's a it's an inshore shore diving area so in Norfolk they had their best year ever Northern Ireland I can see that we've got Constance on the call and she's one of the volunteers in Northern Ireland and again they had an, they had an amazing year in terms of what their volunteers did they went out they organized themselves they did a lot of exploratory shore dives they found new sites and again they've got a stunning number of forms that they've had submitted so we've got great data from northern ireland so it's very patchy overall i say it's running at about i don't know 55 percent in terms of you know the number of forms submitted but it is patchy it's going to be similar this coming year I suspect but in some ways it's great because we're, we're going back if you like to the origins of sea search and that sort of community science approach that we just enable people and they take the reins up and they they go out there and they do it for themselves with our support so it's it's different <laughs> everything's different nowadays um, but it it hasn't been a complete disaster for us in terms of data in 2020. Well, that's good to hear. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of other questions, actually, which perhaps you could just hang around for, Charlotte. Yep, um, no there's one from Rebecca Nichols saying that she used to assist sea search in North Wales, but now lives further inland in South England. And are there any other ways that people can help out sea search without being close to the sea? I'd say drop us a line, see what we can do. Yeah, OK, great. We, we, are, we are working on ways that people can get involved you know, with sea search. In other ways, obviously, you know, the, the, the primary way will always be to, um, to to get out in the sea, whether that's diving or snorkeling or whatever, and submit your records that way. Um, but, you know, contact us. And if and if it's not going to work for sea search specifically, then the Marine Conservation Society has a volunteer network um, with the sea champions. And potentially, you know, you can do something with them and uh, or beach watch. Um, lots and lots of ways to get involved. So just, you know, drop us a line and we'll see what we Great. can do. Lovely. Thank you. And I think that that sort of links with Toby's question about whether there's an intertidal equivalent to sea search. Um, so Charlotte suggested a couple of options there of, of various different organisations you could get involved oh. with. I mean, we do we do have forms. Of, if you go for a shore dive in the Channel Islands at high water, it's an intertidal dive. Um, if your local wildlife trust may well have a shore search program of intertidal surveys um, you can submit things via iRecord um, I would say don't let not knowing what you can do um, stop you doing things drop us a line and if it's if it's not specifically sea search we can probably point you in the right direction Oh. Lovely, thank you. Thanks, Charlotte. And and just to also point out for sort of intertidal stuff, there's there's not often bio blitzes organised as and when we're allowed. So so that's also an option for sort of intertidal uh, recording. And you often get lots of very experienced intertidal scientists who who really know their species who can assist with identifications. 
Um, we've got another question from Paul Summerfield, who's saying, do you account for sampling effort on a dive-by-dive -dive basis, for example, specimens per hour of searching? No, there's no um, uh, inclusion of that level of complexity in the, in the models yet. It's, it's purely a, a, a presence uh, record. Um, I'm sure the, the guys at CEH are kind of working to, to expand that to include um, kind of time standardized uh, abundances or abundances, but it's, it's not included at the moment. Okay, thank you. And um, another one from um, Sarah from Devon Sea Fisheries. I'm just going to find that one. So she said she really, really enjoyed your talk regarding the data um, that, that, and Devon and uh, Devon and South, I can't remember the, what the DNS stands for, IFCA, has collected Devon from fishing vessels, Devon and South, I thought it was, from fishing vessels in South Devon, where they're recording size and sex of all catches of crawfish and doing some tagging work. Perhaps mm. the occupancy model could be used on these data. Locations are up to 60 metres depth and six miles off. Uh, they're certainly very valuable to know about. Um, whether they can be incorporated in the, the occupancy model um, I'm less certain. The using the sea search records is is ideal because everything the divers will collect records of pretty much everything that they see and are able to identify on a dive, and that's what allows us to estimate the probability of detection if you don't actually see it. Um, and if you're just getting records only of, of of crawfish, then you're not getting that extra ability to to assess. The detectability of that that target species, so they're certainly valuable for kind of making those um, kind of time plots or the the, the animations of, of changes through time. It can be really informative about um, course changes, but they can't contribute at, at the moment, at least, uh, to to those models. Um, but they can uh, provide a, yeah much more uh, or a different type of, of interesting information about where they're being found. Great stuff, thank you. And I think Sarah was saying she'd love to have a chat with you sometime as well. Yeah, for sure. I, I've been meaning to, to, to get back in touch with uh, Sarah for a while, so um, yeah, definitely uh, overdue on my part. Great stuff, thank you. And, and a final question here from Anya. They're saying, what are your future aspirations for sea search data and benthic species? Are you working on any other research using the data? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, we've got a whole bunch of projects uh, with, with Natural England um, to do with diversities of assemblages, um, uh, comparisons between protected areas and not protected areas, uh, various um, aspirational projects to do with uh, distributions of, of merle. Um, kind of ideally, kind of my big aspiration would be to, to have uh, sea search contributing to population trends in the, in the State of Nature report. I think that would be a big, uh, a big step forward. Um, and a big gap filled, so um, I'll be working towards that for the next uh, the next edition in in about uh, eighteen months time, um, provided they're they're happy with uh, with the sorts of sorts of uh, data that we can we can provide with it. Brilliant, lovely. Thanks ever so much, Angus. Fantastic talk. Um, thank you to all of our speakers. I I don't know if we have any hands up, Jack. Can I just check? I thought I saw a hand up. Bob had his hand up a minute ago. I think. Yeah. Uh, up again. Um. Thanks very much, Angus, for that talk. Um, I one obviously from a Southwest Marine Ecosystem point of view, we um, are interested in in sort of responses on an annual basis of uh, observations that have been made by all sorts of people. And uh, going back about I think it was five or six or seven years ago, Sea Search used to produce a kind of quite a simple report. Um, I think it was just electronic, but actually covered the kind of, you know, the, if you like, the highs and lows of what, what had happened on a kind of regional basis. I mean, I haven't seen that for quite some time. I don't know whether the, you, you guys still do this. I mean, Charlotte might want to answer this. But it's this exactly the sort of material that was at, you know, we would actually normally include in the Southwest Marine Ecosystems report. Um, I have to say, you know, so that's one, one question. There was a second, if I may. Um, I was kind of, you know, your, your offshore grid's got a lot of offshore sites. You know, I know from a very long time ago that divers like going back to the same places, you know, and actually your squares could be reduced by probably uh, down by a hundred, you know, to a hundredth simply based on where divers actually go. And of course, if you then do cumulative assessments like the curve you showed in your species plot, you soon see what are absent and present. So it's the absences that are often quite stark. So it's a sort of second question, really, is that 
if divers keep on going to the same sort of site year on year on year and, and, and things are absent, then by and large, they generally are. And, and that, that's why you know, the crawfish, which is a strikingly obvious thing when it stares you in the face, yeah. unlike many other species, which are difficult to identify, that's why crawfish, um, you know, in a certain sense, stuck out so obviously when they did well. So it's a, that's, there's a second question about absences, really. Um, it would also apply to crabs and lobsters as well, of course, but a, a number of other species. So the, the, the first question was essentially about, is there a kind of a, a sort of an annual summary of the highs and lows of sea search on a kind of regional basis? And the second question is about absences. Well, I'll... I'll um jump in for the absences question first and i think charlotte might uh, might be best place to to respond to your first question there bob um yes that that tendency of divers to go back to places where they they know they can see the things they want to see to, to go to wrecks to go to interesting reefs um is as an additional form of of bias um that it becomes much harder for uh, statistical models to, to deal with and and you're right um, that grid is is larger than it necessarily needs be um, but if if there are no uh, records in those grid cells in the model they just get they just di dis discarded so it was, it was just a uh, a quick and easy way of allocating sites to records in in gis that that was used so it doesn't the extent of those squares doesn't actually matter too much um, and if things are actually absent, um, then you have those that that continuous series of, of zeros in the detection history um, that then go into the calculation of the um, of the, uh, the the population trend. Um, if no one's ever been there, there's no zeros. There's just no data, and those that's disregarded. So I, I don't quite know whether that answers your your query about the the absences, but uh, yeah, yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. Great, thank you very much. Bob, is there anything you'd like to add as we come to an end of today's webinar? Yes, a, a massive vote of thanks, Mark, for, for you and, and for Jack and, and all of the speakers, Chris and, and, and Matt and Angus for, you know, for, for a fantastic job. I mean, I've been monitoring the, uh, you know, the attendance and things. We've had up to 180, you know, 83, I think, people attending, which is fantastic, you know, from you know, way across the country. So, you know, it just shows the scope of this. And, and thank you very much for taking the plunge with the first one of these. <laughs> There's only another 10 to come, guys <laughs> and gals. <laughs> so I look forward to seeing you there. And, and, and don't forget, um, you know, to send in your uh, records for, you know, I was just reiterating Keith's point. Um, Keith put his uh, email up. I'll put it in the questions and things as well. Um, please send us your records from last year. would be you know, fascinating to know what you found interesting, novel, new, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much indeed. Thanks, Bob. Thanks very much to everyone that's attended. Thank you for all the speakers. Thank you, Jack, behind the scenes uh, for sorting out all the IT and webinar issues. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. Right. And look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.